session organizational culture. Now, organizational culture is the personality of a workplace shaped by its shared values, beliefs, and of course, behaviors. Now, Charles Handy, one of the key pioneers of different organizational cultures, said there was power culture, role culture, task culture, and person culture. Now, the first bit of this video, I wanna go through each of these types of cultures and explain them one by one. And at the end of this video, I'd like to look at evaluation for organizational cultures and how you could use that and apply that into longer questions. Let's get on power culture. This is part of Handy's organizational cultures. Now, power cultures is when decisions are coming from one centralized figure, the person in the middle of the organization. And that that person is where power and influence will exert itself from. It will emanate from there. Now, Handy saw power culture as like a web, a spider web. And in the middle, the green dot there is where that power and influence comes from. Now, the advantages of using power culture, well, it suits smaller organizations. Smaller organizations where they can react quickly to changes, they can react quickly to threats. Think about the T in SWOT analysis. And the reason why is because of few rules, few procedures, few, few processes, maybe little bureaucracy, not much admin that needs to be completed in order to communicate or to make a decision because everything's coming from the middle. Now, a disadvantage of using power culture is firstly, well, decisions often come from that middle person and they might be solely based on influence. And therefore, it might, it's likely that it might lead to decisions being made on hunch, on instincts, as opposed to in role culture, where they might be based on science, on purely logic. Now, another problem and perhaps a bigger problem of power culture is that ultimately, if the business grows, it gets bigger. That means more activities are put on that spider web and the spider web itself breaks because the one centralized person cannot simply handle everything. So that's a real issue. Can it cope when you have a growing business? Now, there's also HR implications with power cultures, because with power cultures, well, often it's seen and Handy quite said this quote, judge by results, tolerant of means. And the fact that the centralized figure is very much hard HRM. They just want the job done. And so it might lead to morale issues. It might lead to high turnover and particularly high labor turnover in that middle management area of the business. And that's obviously problematic for a business. Now, the last thing to think about in terms of evaluation is, well, the effectiveness really depends upon the skill set, the ability, the able to get results done by the middle of that of that web being the centralized figure. How good are they? Do they have the skills? If they do, probably more likely to be successful. And also there's long term implications when we think about power cultures, because if that centralized figure is gone, what is the business like? Because there you think about a web without a spider. Well, it doesn't have much hope of surviving. I hope that helps. Role cultures. This is part of Handy's organizational cultures. Now, role cultures is built on bureaucracy. The culture is built on bureaucracy and it's based on logic. It's based on rationality. Now, Handy saw role culture as like a Greek temple and a Greek temple where power comes from position. And also these pillars here, these four pillars, they're strong because they're built on expertise. And you could see those four pillars as also ultimately the functional areas being operations, HR, marketing and finance. Now, advantage of using this role culture. Well, it's based, as I said before, on, log on logical, rational decisions where rules, procedures are followed, decisions are made on expertise, and it very much suits a stable environment, stable environment, larger organisations. Some you could, sometimes you could see it as a well-oiled machine, very mechanistic by nature. Disadvantages though, well, the mechanistic by nature bit is a disadvantage too, because it means it's slow to react to change, very slow to react to change, because when there's procedures for a role, you need to follow those procedures, those rules. If you want to communicate, you need to follow those procedures. So there's always a delay, a lag in any decisions that are made. And ultimately this type of culture, well, it wants last year and the year before and this year to be exactly the same as next year. It wants stability super important for it. And like a Greek temple, when you've got shaky ground, well, the temple will crumble, the temple will fall. And that is the problem here with role culture. And also it really wants you to have long product life cycles. It doesn't want short product life cycles, can't cope with that in this type of role culture. And another thing is that it lacks innovation because you tend to get people that work up the organization that are job satisficers. They're working up the organization because they do the job well. They're not necessarily eagerly innovative. 
So that doesn't allow for an innovative culture within the business. They're just good at doing the job and that's how they've moved up the org. Now evaluation, well it depends on ultimately the effectiveness of the rules, the effectiveness of the procedures, if you're in that stable environment for a larger organisation, if it's going to work. If they are really effective, it's likely that the ultimate plan will be met. Now, the other thing to think about is that idea about the type of person that might be promoted through the organisation, that job satisficer. And if that's what you want, great. But if you want innovation, you want those eagerly ambitious people, well, it might not be suitable for them. You might not be able to keep them. And also, in terms of like when it's good, when it's bad, well, it's good when you want to have economies of scale. It really suits that as a larger, larger organisation. But if you want flexibility, you want flexibility, maybe you want to be an organic organisation, well, it's not going to help you there having role culture. I hope that helps. I'll see you at the next session on task culture. So task culture is very much project orientated. Handy saw it as a net. A net because it's associated with, of course, matrix structures. And the power here is at the intersection of the strings that divide up the business, the knots, as he called them. And that some of these strings are stronger than others because some individuals are better than other individuals. And so very much here, you're creating that team environment. It's project based. And so the advantages are flexible, very, very flexible. So important that is extremely adaptable teams in projects with those teams. You'll be putting the right people, the right skills the right amount of resources there, and those teams are flexible, you can reform them, you can repurpose them, you could abandon them if you need to. And there's control over work, it's very much workers can get on with what the team wants, there's less hard HRM, very much soft HR, HRM there, it's very much motivated in terms of that environment, and it's useful if you have short product life cycles, and you want speed of reaction because of that flexibility that comes from matrix structures. Now the disadvantage of using uh, task culture is that it lacks depth of expertise because these teams are constantly repurposing for different areas. Um, they're abandoned and then they have to go on to another project. It's very much consultancy here. They might not have that depth of expertise that you might see in role culture in those pillars of the Greek temple. Now, it's hard to get economies of scale here because you're constantly chopping and changing what you're doing. And so that might be an issue if you're a price conscious business, for example, and you want to bring the cost per unit down. Now, control is difficult here because the, the managers, the top of the business, well, they hard to control uh, the workers because all they really control is who's on the project, how much resource is given to the project and the time of the project. OK, and they very much trust the individual at the intersection, the knots who are going to run the project and hopefully run it well for them. Now, the flaw and the breakdown of task culture is that when um, finances run out. So it very much depends on finances. If finance are scarce, there's not enough finances available, well, that's when problems happen. Because those knots, those middle managers, they might get a little bit salty, they might get political. And if they get political, they start to focus on their own individual targets, individual uh, wants, and therefore it starts to break down the task culture, it becomes demotivating, and that's the end of it, really. And in that case, if that happens, and if managers at the top see this happening, well, then they need to revert away from a task culture towards a power or a role culture, whatever makes sense for the business. Maybe if it's a small business, you would go to a, a power culture, and if it's a larger business, you would go to a role culture. It's a session on person culture. Now, person culture is an unusual one. It's an unusual one because it's essentially an organisation where the organisation just exists really to serve the best interests of the individual or individuals. And you might have support staff, you might have admin staff, and they're all there just to serve the individual or individuals. Now, it's referred to by Handy as a cluster, a cluster because it's loads of dots and they are all stars. So it is a galaxy of individual stars that exist within an organisation. An example of where this operates, you might get architect partnerships, law partnerships, small consultancies where there's some superstars within those organisations. The advantage here of having a person culture, and remember it's very rare, is that the most uh, relevant skills, the person with the most relevant skills will be making the decisions. They will have the power, they will have the influence on these decisions. So maybe that's good because the right person's making the decisions. The disadvantage, however, is that these individuals, they're very much self-interested. They're there for themselves, to further their career, further their finances and so forth. And often they're very difficult to manage, and that's, if that's required, of course, and another thing to think about is the individual, well, the individual 
has the power to leave the organisation, but the organisation doesn't have the power to evict the individual because they're such a superstar. So I hope that helps and I'll see you at the next. So I hope that helps with organisational cultures going through the different types there. One thing to remember with organisational culture is that it cannot be precisely defined. It's something that's perceived, it's something that is felt. But when we're thinking about the evaluation points, the factors really that show the outcomes of org uh, culture, let's go through them. So the first one is ownership structure. So ownership structure, we're thinking about if ownership is very concentrated, maybe there's just one shareholder, one dominant shareholder, then likely power culture is going to be the outcome. Founder dominated business, family firms is where you might see that. The second one is the size of the organisation. If it's a large business, probably role culture will suit. The third thing is tech change. How fast is the technological change in the industry? If it is very fast, you'll probably want task in place because of the flexibility or power in place because of the adaptability. So adaptable, flexible is what you want to be there. However, if the business is manufacturing and it heavily relies on automation, it's very capital intensive, maybe there that might be a situation where role culture will make sense. Next one to think about is goals and objectives of the business. If you're trying to grow and you are currently in power culture, you'll probably want to move to role culture. Also, role culture will give you that consistency in your quality because of the different pillars working through their specialist tasks. Next thing to think about is how diverse the organisation is. If the organisation is very diverse, then you probably want to have a task culture in place. If you've got different nationalities, they might have different cultural preferences. You might want to think about Hofstede there, another model. Next thing to think about is the type of people in your organisation. So if you've got those with workers with high security needs, you're thinking about Maslow here, then role culture might make sense. And if you've got low calibre, low skilled employees, then again here, role culture might make sense for them. I hope that helps with that mega sesh and I'll see you at the next sesh.